I'm joined by Kyle Bogomis. Welcome, Kyle. How are you? Raja Suleiman with Orzov. Max McVitie. Wow. Congratulations, wow. Brian DeMars. Zach Allen. <laughs> I wouldn't be here without these guys, though, so. And the champion of Proto Concert Arcade, Ari Lax. Welcome, everybody, to On the List, brought to you by RW Hobbies and Games in Livonia, Michigan. I am Zach, and today we're joined by. Roger Solman. So, new segment for everybody. We have started a list series to uh, try and provide people with some meaningful content for relevant things in Magic and maybe things they might be interested in. And today, we are bringing you a top 10 list of. The best cards sticking around in standard post rotation. We want to really yep, yep. go for it. Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, card rising away. And this is around the time where people start transitioning their mindset to what's the best deck right now to what we think is going to be the best deck uh, post rotation. Uh, and in order to do that, obviously, you need to know what the cards are in the new set. But having an eye uh, on all the cards that were the best cards from the previous sets. It's important to recognizing what might be the strongest decks week one, right? Yeah, definitely. I mean, the uh, largely the context of the new set, the power level of those cards is determined by what the strongest cards that are left over are, right? Where it's like, you might see a really sweet creature, but if it's particularly bad against the most played removal spell that's left over, well, then maybe that creature's not actually that good. Or... You know, vice versa. Maybe there's a new removal spell that looks good, but it doesn't really line up very well against the best creature. And you know, the 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 whole stand. You know, the whole st every card in standard has to be evaluated in the context of its standard. And even though we're getting a new set that's probably going to have a lot of powerful cards in it, four fifths of new standard is still out right now, and we can look at what it's going to look like mostly at the moment. Exactly, and we definitely saw that this past year had um, its fair share of uh, high powered cards. So it's not like we're necessarily dealing with cards that are going to be underpowered because they're older. Uh, if anything, we're kind of hoping that we see some uh, underpowered sets in the future, or at least more leveled off. Um, so it's a good chance that a lot of the cards that are still legal are going to be the strongest cards in the format. I totally agree. I will say we have like 10 banned cards in standard right now, so this you got to take this list with a grain of salt because it would look a lot different if there were some unbans. I'll say that much. Yeah, I feel like there would be some sort of blue-green Planeswalker near the top. Um, but, yeah, you know. maybe. That Oko card was pretty good. Yeah, right, yeah. I don't... I, honestly, though, like, is he better than Once Upon a Time? Probably. Once Upon a Time was pretty dumb, though. He probably yeah, was better. Yeah, really stupid. <laughs> Fires of Invention is also, like, one of those cards that's like, why Why did we print this? Yeah, Throne of Eldraine was a... <laughs> Uh, that might be a recurring theme you're going to see on this set, is that Throne of Eldraine was a pretty good set. Uh, Alright, so let's dive right in. We got some honorable mentions before we actually get in the top ten. Raja, any, any cards you want to honorably mention here? Yeah, one card that was able to make our top ten, but I think is going to be very strong, and is strong right now, is uh, Dol Real. Um, it was a card from M21, the two mana one, two. Uh, whenever you draw your second card for each turn, you get to make a 2-2 two -two token, cat token. And then you can pay 6 mana to make uh, all your creatures have a base power toughness of XX, where X is your hand size. Um, this card is kind of just like an army in a cam. It doesn't ask too much for you because of you because you want to be drawing cards in Magic anyway. And there's cards like Uro, which curves perfectly with uh, with Joriel that immediately makes you a 2-2. Two -two. Um, and then there's cards like... Uh, you know, Landward Visionary, uh, the new Jace from uh, Battle for Zendikar, or excuse me, for Zendikar Rising. There's a lot of things. It's not very hard to find cards that draw cards. There's still opts. Um, and then if you're playing cards that you want to be playing already, which are card draw spells, you're still creating board presence. So now you're getting advantage on both fronts. And it's also got this powerful end game that I've used uh, multiple times. It was very, admittedly, it was very good with Nissa lands because they would become base XXs with the counter still. But I think that 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 uh, ultimate is still going to be very strong 
Um, I think it's just one of the better cards that um, M21 presented with, but not quite enough to make our top 10, but I still like it. Yeah, I totally agree. And for me, I'm going to honorably mention Vivian Monster's Advocate. There was a lot of talk of maybe maybe Vivian should be on the top 10 list. I think it's really close with the 9th and 10th card, but ultimately we ended up cutting her. We do, we do know from War of the Spark, after playing with War of the Spark cards for over a year now, that passive abilities on Planeswalkers are kind of busted. And they're very, very strong. And Vivian's pa- Vivian has a passive, which no other Planeswalker in Standard will have post-rotation, at least that we know of. And that's going to be very strong. Uh, although Vivian's passive is like, it's only effective on your turn, where a lot of the passives that were good were effective all the time. They like change the rules of the game. And hers is just like, uh, you get this value engine. It does work really well, and it is a very powerful effect to just be able to cast creatures off the top of your deck. Uh, We'll see how well it ends up working out. You know, largely she's going to be contextual to how good cheaper green creatures are in the format. Like, how how much do you need an experimental for for green creatures, essentially? Or, like, you know, maybe cheaper, cheaper creatures in a color that pairs well with green, right? So, we'll have to see where where she lands contextually, but the effect is powerful enough that she should definitely be close to the top of this list. Another thing going for her too is just that Nissa's rotating out, and I think we don't see her a lot right now just because Nissa's so, so dominant in standard. But with no more five mana green plan green planeswalkers, I could see Vivian I could see Vivian easily cracking this top ten once we actually start playing with the new cards. Yeah, I was, you beat me too. I was gonna say that it was really hard for us to tell how good she was in standard because Nissa overshadowed her so much. Yep. Uh, so there's a chance it would have been very good without Nissa, even in this past format, despite how powerful the part it was. So, like, yeah, we're definitely in for a treat here when uh, Nissa rotates and other five mana green spells are playable again. Yeah, I mean, that'll be sweet. It's also just, like, going to be cool to see how just how good she actually can be because I have played her in decks in this standard, and she was always... She always impressed every single time I played her, and just yeah, I don't know. We'll see. But let's yeah, get into the, to well later. let's get into the top ten though, because that's what the people came here for. Raja at number ten, we have the Woe Strider. How do you feel about Woe Strider? Yeah, Woe Strider is uh, definitely one that is um, worthy of an inclusion. I think it's a card that gives you an effect that is super important in the decks that you want to play Woe Strider in which is a, a free sacrifice outlet. Um, it gives you an immediate body, which is also usually pretty good in decks that are fueling engines off of sacrificing. And then also gives you a way to kind of insulate yourself against sweepers in the form of its, um, its escape mechanic. Um, and decks like that usually are pretty good at filling the graveyard as well because they're inherently able to put cards in the graveyard immediately through sacrificing. Um, we know that it pairs really well with Clean the Firstborn. Um, just a strong card that, at the end of the day, it's a 3 3 2 that does a ton. Yep. And we, I mean, we've just seen over and over in Standard so far that the escape mechanic is kind of busted. And you only ever really want one escape card in your deck. It's not a mechanic that pairs well with other cards that have the same mechanic. But Woe Strider is one of the best of them. It has proven time and time again that it might not be the best. There might be another one coming up later with it, but it's probably right. It probably is the second best so far in terms of success it's put up across a bunch of formats. And the card just overperforms. Free stack outlets that scry just always end up being better than you think they are. And it just ends up just doing so much more than it looks like it would on its on the surface. And like you said, it's still just a, a card that can attack. Just three mana three twos get in there. So yeah, I will, I will say that Will Strider is probably the best uh, card with escape, where you're more interested in the front half. Yeah, like if Will Strider didn't have escape, it would probably still be playable in the decks that we played in. But the fact that it has escape is just kind of gravy. Yep. Whereas I don't think you can say that about a lot of the other escape cards from Lethirios Beyond Death. It's interesting. Um, the only other one I can think about that I would do that is also a black card and cling to dust. So I think you're right. But yeah, interesting. Right. Yeah, it just shows how premium it is to have a free stack outlet. Like, no matter what the card does, like, yep. it's just so good. Well, it just ends up making other cards in your deck just so much better than they would be otherwise, right? 
Exactly. Yep. Okay. Let's move on to number nine. Number nine, we have a favorite of yours, Raja. We have the Questing Beast. How do you feel yeah. about the Questing Beast? I think Questing Beast is very good. I think uh, any base green deck that's looking to attack post rotation is going to start with three to four copies of Questing Beast. Um, I think it's a great way to pressure any planeswalkers that come out. Um, all those mechanics, vigilance, death touch, uh, the fact that it can't be blocked by creature's power to a less. It's just, it, it's. It has a lot of text, but at the end of the day, it's just a, a, a beater that comes in fast and, and hits hard. And it also pairs really well with anything that gives trample. We've seen it um, pair really nicely with uh, Embercleave. Yep. And who knows if there's other cards in the next set that can make it even better. Um, but, yeah, you can't go wrong with Questing Beast. Yeah, I mean, I 100% agree with you. Questing Beast, even if it's not seeing a lot of main deck play, is the type of card where you know every single green deck next format is going to have like two in its sideboard because it's just so good at pressuring planeswalkers and the more the more we play standard the more it feels like a format dedicated to planeswalkers i mean it's it's been you know less so at points this standard i i can kind of think of the time where team of wreck was dominant it wasn't all about planeswalkers but for almost the rest of this whole year playing with these new cards it's been a format about planeswalkers I mean, when Oko was legal, it was all about Oko. Teferi was nonsense and just about Teferi. Nyssa has been one of the best cards on Standard for two years now. And yeah, I mean, when a format is about Planeswalkers, Questing Beast is as good as green is going to get in terms of Planeswalker removal. And yeah, I just you're going to see it next format. This card's not going away. Yeah, and to your point about it being a cyborg card, that's usually like the mid-range decks that don't really want to start creatures that just attack. Mm -hmm. But I think any of the aggressive decks are going to be wanting to play this card uh, in high qualities in the main deck. Sure, totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. But it's it's just the type of card that's so good at what it does, and there's just no parallel to its effect in this color combination that even decks that don't want it main will just have it in its 75 if, if they're in the green color. For sure, I agree. Okay. Let's move on to number eight. At number eight, we have... Elspeth, Sun's Nemesis... Oh, no, wait. We have the actually good Elspeth card. It is <laughs> Elspeth Conquers Death. How yeah, do we feel about... about this one. I know this card is uh, a card that you... I think this is a card that you identified as one of the better cards in the set. Prior to most people. Uh, did you want to tell us why this card is our uh, eighth on the list? Yeah, absolutely. I, and, I mean, you're right. They're like, when... when uh, Theros was getting spoiled. It was my favorite card in the set. I actually didn't like Uro. Uh... We'll get to that later. I, I was talking yeah. down about Uro, so... I was giving you credit. You just destroyed any credit you had left. Yeah, I've lost a lot of credit for that one. But I'm still going to take the credit for this one. I deserve it. I called this one way ahead of time. I said I thought it was going to be one of the better cards in the set. A lot of people thought it was wrong. Turned out this actually is probably, I don't know, the second or third best card in the entire set. Um, And Elspeth Conquer's Death is just such a perfect removal spell for for white and really for standard as a whole at the moment because in standard you just don't see removal being played at all really there's just not very much spot removal that you see anywhere and the fact that Elspeth Conquers Death hits something basically anything it's it's not really limited to the permanent type it's limited by CMC right so it can hit a planeswalker it can hit a, you know an expensive enchantment it can hit an indestructible creature it can hit a creature that you know, maybe it keeps coming back from the graveyard. That like a whoa strider that you need to get out of there. Um, it exiles any of them, but then it does the thing that's really important for standard, and it gives you value on the back half, and that's really what lets you play it. Because if it was just, if it was just what it did, five mana exile target permanent, and you got rid of the the restriction of like three or less or whatever it has, it wouldn't be good enough. Just absolutely no chance. But because it gives you this extra value on the back end, it is a game plan. It functions as an engine in your deck to take away from your opponent and add to your board. And that's so important in standard because you just need your cards to give you value. And that's why we just don't see spot removal right now in like Heartless Act or any basically any spot removal at all. There's some counter spells, but there's not really spot removal. And it's because you need it to be an engine. And this is just the only one that actually is. Yeah, one thing I'll say is that like we've seen a trend in recent um, state of magic where playing to the board and doing the biggest, best thing you can possibly do is really important. And the way that this card undoes what your opponent does, but also gives you an opportunity to to create like mana and cards by 
reanimating a card that you know costs three to four or five mana, whatever it is, you're you're both answering your opponent's proactive plan, but you're also being semi proactive yourself two turns later mm -hmm. with no mana investment, and like that's a way to win the board, right? And I think the reason why people underestimated this card when it first got spoiled is because they likened it to Yellow Reborn, which admittedly is a very similar card, but there's a huge distinction in the fact that Yellow Reborn got their worst creature, their worst Planeswalker, whereas ECD got the best one. So you weren't answering the card that they played three turns ago, you were answering the card that they played last turn. Yep. In addition to the fact that it exiles, which is acknowledged it's very good against escape cards and things of that nature. So like... Yeah, I think ECD is like just great. And the fact that we saw it pair really well with Teferi. Teferi's rotating. That's probably a good thing. But we still have um, Yurion, right? And that's a, that's a great combo, too. Yeah, we also saw it pair really well with Narset, and Narset's leaving. Although, we have seen a new blue three mana Planeswalker on Standard that is pretty likely to die. And maybe we'll talk about that later. But the, the, the concept of playing. Permanents that are super, super valuable and cheap that are just... The problem with them is they're not very durable. They die pretty easy. Pairing those cards with ECD is usually a pretty good idea. So, uh, you know, it was a strategy that people, you know, used to a lot of success. So, we'll see how good ECD actually ends up being. I think it's going to be quite good in this new format. But let's let's move on to number seven here. At number seven, we have Ugin the Spirit Dragon. What's up with Ugin? Raja, it's kind of shocking that it's this low on the list, right? Yeah, I think we've seen, um, you know, I think Ugin was one of the cards that was um, most hyped out of the most recent core set, uh, for good reason. But I think we saw it get kind of outclassed by first Reclamation decks. Um, and then I think right now it's maybe like Casualties of War is kind of keeping it down. Um, and Permission is okay against it too. But this is a card that, like, is one of your best payoffs in the ramp deck, right? Mm -hmm. And we're going back to Zendikar Rising, which is a... Uh, Zendikar has been uh, historically a plane that kind of favors casting big spells. Yep. Um, and so, you know, if they give us incentives to be playing a lot of mana, Lugan's going to be in those decks almost guaranteed, right? Um, it gives a way for um, all colors to answer permanents that maybe they can't usually answer, like... A black deck answering enchantments, for example. Um, and it's just like one of the best endgame cards. Um, I think the reason why it's not as high on this list is because this past year has given us so many powerful cards, and we'll get to those soon. But uh, Ugin is definitely a card that you can't sleep on. It's just a card that you need to constantly be aware of when deck building, uh, just because of the constraints that it, it puts on. Like, if you're too, if you're too mid range, you're going to get uh, blown out by this card. Uh, so you incentivize you to be a little more aggressive or have permits diversified to where they're surviving uh, to sweep because they're colorless or because they have four more toughness. It's just like, it, it's one of those cards that changes how you play your decks and build your decks. Totally agree. I will say, you know, the, the reason why it's been so bad recently is Nissa because Nissa's lands were colorless. And I, I, I do think you missed that. You said Reclamation and then you're like, well, you know, casualties. But I think it's Nissa and... Also, for some period of time, it was Elspeth Conqueror's Death, because Elspeth Conqueror's Death is just a phenomenal follow-up to Ugin, minus it on your board. You just get to eat their Ugin, and now you're back being proactive ahead of them. Um, so, that is good. I will say, too, you said Zendikar is a, a format that's historically rampy. It's also or it's also a plane that's historically color colorless heavy. So, it's possible that we get some good Eldrazi, although I think those are gone. But the original Zendikar had some pretty good artifacts, too. So, you never know. We could see a lot of colorless stuff here, and then uh, Ugin could get a lot better if there's, you know, you can pair him in a deck that plays colorless cards, so the the Wrath is one-sided. That's a really powerful effect. Nis is gone, so, like, the per like green and white both had amazing follow-ups to Ugin that just answered it, like, almost perfectly. And those, you know, the green one's gone, the white one's still there, but I think it's still pretty likely that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be able to that Ugin's going to be a lot more dominant than it was, just because Nissa's so prevalent. Like, Nissa leaving just opens the door for Ugin to be a lot better than it looked like it was, I guess, during this format. So I think I think that one's playability is going to look a lot higher uh, post-rotation than it does at the moment, and I think people might be shocked by that, I guess. But Yeah, I will say that we're not really um, 
starving for ramp effects anyway, because we did get some nice ones from uh, Corset and Cultivate, Psalm Semi-Life from, and um, Elvish Visionary. Mm -hmm. So, like, or Landmark Visionary, excuse me. And so, like, we already have a lot of those tools. So, if they give us even just, like, one more thing and then some payoffs to pair with it, like you said, I think that deck's going to be uh, a contender at least. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. We the the color combination does really need a two mana ramp effect now. Uh, we have Wolf of yeah. Haven, but we yeah, could yeah. use another one. Um, but we'll, you know, we'll see what happens. A colorless ramp effect like a Mind Stone would be uh, really good for Ugin. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah, my phone's really good. We'll I'd be surprised they printed that on standard. Well, I maybe I would also be surprised if they reprinted it in standard. But they printed Oko, so who knows? They could print anything. <laughs> we can't put anything past them anymore. Yeah, it's true. Um, okay, number six on the list, we have the Shark Typhoon. Why is there Shark Typhoon at number six? I'm going to let you take care of this one, Zach. I want to hear what you have to say about it. Okay, well, I've been playing a lot of Shark Typhoon recently, and Shark Typhoon, I, this is one we're low confidence in being this high, because a lot of its versatility previously was that it was so good at answering 3-Mana Teferi, and now that 3-Mana Teferi's gone... It's less good. It is, however, a very good answer to an Ugin in the sense that if they, you know, play an Ugin, minus eat your whole board, boom, end of turn, cycle my Shark Typhoon, draw a card, have a thing big enough to kill your Ugin. It does a lot of really powerful things. The fact that it's like an uncounterable flash threat that can be pretty big is just really, really strong. Uh, the cycling mechanic itself is really strong. We don't have any other cycling cards on the list, spoiler, but... Cycling is a is a mechanic that is very powerful, and Ikoria, like basically block set Ikoria cycling deck, has had success at points in the standard, and it's because just the mechanic itself is very strong. So this card having cycling is very strong, and then, I mean, we just talked about how ramp there's a there's a real possibility ramp exists in this format. Shark Typhoon is a really interesting ramp card because you can just hard cast it, and when it's in play, it's really powerful. Um, you don't usually want to do that. It usually ends up being wrong, but you know the fact that you have the option just makes it so strong. You know what I mean? For sure. Yeah. So I think uh, I think Shark Typhoon ramp decks make sense. I think Shark Typhoon and Luka decks. If we get a big creature that pays off for playing the Luka, um, no creature except for the big creature plus tokens combo. Sure. Um, I think that it's a nice way to kind of like. I don't know if hedge is the right word, but like have a card in your deck that is good late, but doesn't just bog you down. It, like it's like it's how cycling works, obviously, but like it, it's the way this card works that it's good at any amount of mana, right? Because it has X and cycling. So like yep. um, we've seen the pressure of planeswalkers very well. Um, you know, it's uncounterable. Uh, you it's got flash cycling, so you have to do these things after sorcery speed effects are, are done taking place for the turn. It's just a card that we've seen be very good. I imagine it's going to be a little worse than it's been uh, recently, but I don't think it's going to just completely fall off the map. I think it's still going to be playable. I definitely agree. Um, okay, at number five, we have Yorion the Sky Nomad. Uh, what? Yorion, number five, over Ugin? What's up with this? Yeah, I think Yorion is going to be very good going forward. I think... It had by far the least amount of impact, like or loss of playability through the ban, or excuse me, through the nerf of the companion mechanic. Um, because the decks that tend to play Yorion tend to play the game longer anyway, because you don't want to play Yorion on turn five anyway, because it's very unlikely that you've accumulated enough permanents on the board that you want to flicker, right? So like mm -hmm. the, the fact that you get to you know hold off on. Like, the longer you wait, the better it gets, especially if you're playing permits that are hard to interact with, like Omens. Makes it so that the, the cost of three mana is kind of, you know, not as impactful going along, right? And then yep. we've seen that there's great cards to blink. Right now there's the Blue Omen, which we've seen be very good in decks that can't even blink it. Um, we've seen that ECD plays really well with it. Um, and the, the whole deck building cost of playing 80 cards, because these sets have been, you know, pretty deep as far as playability, it's made it so that um, it doesn't feel as taxing as it might have five years ago. Um, even like if you're playing uh, tutor effects like Luca, uh, even your mana bases with Table Passage get a little better sometimes because of Table Passages. Now, you don't want to play basics, but you have to play basics for the Table Passage. 
it just doesn't feel like it's too costly. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like the card that kind of all the blue control decks are going to be looking at first, in my opinion. Uh, and that's assuming we get, you know, almost nothing out of uh, Zendikar Rising. If we get any good enchantments or cards you want to flicker, um, I think you're going to be, you know, still one of the best strategies in the standard. Yeah, I definitely agree with you on Yorion. I'll also say, too, like you just mentioned it as a companion, and that's where you're most likely to see it, but there are decks in this format that are playing it main to go with Charming Prince from Throne of the Eldraine, and that is a combo that creates kind of this lock piece against other decks where just permits keep coming in and out of play, and you can't really answer it with one sweeper, and they're generating you value every time they do this loop, and both of those cards stuck around, and we still have enchantments that generate value when they enter the battlefield. Those are all from... Theros, essentially. And who's to say we don't get more? It's totally possible we get more things that are good to blink with Yorion. There are a lot of things with Enter the Battlefield effects nowadays. I would not rule out main deck play from Yorion going forward. It is, you know, people people registered it at the Pro Tour in their main deck, so... Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't consider that, but that's definitely something we've seen. And we've seen it be... Honestly, we've seen it be both main deck and sideboard, usually. When you're yep. playing a main deck, you probably have it as your companion, too. So you just want all the copies, right? Yep. And it's it's enter the battlefield effect is just so powerful that you like as long as Elspeth conquers death is in the format you have to think that Yorian will also be seeing play because so they just pair so well together. Okay, yep. number four we have the Ember Cleave. Only equipment on the list, but you have to believe in the cleave, right, Raja? Oh yeah, yeah. This has been a card that since day one has been just. Basically, one of the reasons to play red, if not the reason. Um, and I, I, as long as there are creatures that can attack, this card's playable. There, there, this card doesn't ask for too much from you, right? And um, and when you can deliver on some attacking creatures, it's just it's game winning. We've seen Embercleave be like, okay, well, I'm perfectly fine as long as they don't have Embercleave here, and they have it, and the game ends on the spot, right? Uh, the card's just phenomenal. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, it works with Questing Beast. There's still a lot of good aggressive creatures from. Um, like Throne of Eldraine had the uh, Fervent Champion, the Rimrock Knight, Bone Crusher Giant. There's still a lot of uh, support in red for uh, creatures on the ground. Um, I mean, there's not too much to say about this card. If you played against this card or with this card, you know how good it is, right? Yeah, I mean, I think you summed it up pretty perfectly where it's just... You don't have to say very much about it because it just does the, the thing where you're dead. The game is over. Let's move on because you think you're in a good spot. They play the cleave, and all right, that's uh, that's all they wrote. Let's uh, go to game two. <laughs> yeah, and I remember Teferi is one of the the cards that I mean, obviously Teferi has not historically been a good card against mono red aggro, but it still had this this role where it became, like it insulated you against Embercleave because yep. Embercleave cost six mana now, right? Because you couldn't flash it in anymore, and it lost that cost reduction. So like. Even that's gone, right? That's just one more thing that, that checked that card. Yep. So, yeah. Plus of that cycle, definitely going to be a player in standard, I'm sure. But Yeah, certainly. I mean, we, we've already started to see some evidence that equipment might matter in the next set. So, uh, if that's the case, then Embercleave is probably pretty good. But yep. let's uh, let's move on. Not, not too much to say about it. Suffice it to say that we put it over some very powerful cards for a good reason because we think it's going to be that good. And, I mean, even historically, like, the last Zendikar, not so much, but the first Zendikar was extremely aggressive. Like, one of the most aggressive sets we've ever seen. And in a format like that, Embercleave is just king. Like, it just wins races by itself every time. So, we'll see where it goes, but... Yeah, I can't imagine it being awesome. All right. Yeah, I think both of the last times we've gone to the Zendikar, we've seen um, a cycle of landfall creatures that get bigger. Yep. Off the wall, um, and that usually spawn an aggro deck. The first time around was like the Boros, uh, Stephanie's Player GMP deck. And the last time around, there was that, I think it was Scythe Leopard. Card Scythe game. Leopard, yeah. And, um, so, like, yeah, there's. I'm sure Zendikar is not going to be all Eldrazi and 10 drops. It's going to be. Allies or you know landfall aggressive creatures, we're gonna see something, and it's gonna be right there. There's gonna be aggro for sure. Okay, at number three, we have Winota. Um, yeah, just Winota. This card is broken. It is a card that we have seen kind of. It got cards banned in standard, although it wasn't just its fault. But uh, Winota 
contributed to a banning of Agent of Treachery, which is a weird card to get banned in Standard, if we're being honest. Um, it got a, it got banned in Historic. The card itself, Winota, did. And then it's now starting to dominate Pioneer, and we're seeing it all over the place in Pioneer. And I would not be shocked if at some point it saw Modern play, although it's close on, on that spectrum, but... Um, this is an insanely powerful card. It uh, We've played it on these videos we've done, and it's just like, <laughs> every time someone's using it, it's like, really? this It it comes into play tapped and attacking? It's indestructible? What Like, why? What, what, are, what are all these things it's doing? Why? And the point I always come back to is that this card isn't a 4-mana 2-2. It's a 4-mana 4-4. Yep. Which is like, <laughs> there was a time where like, Format of four fours with very little text were very playable standard. And like yep. obviously I'm not trying to be a boomer here. Magic's come a long way since then, but like like that the effect that it has, it's, it's, that effect is like good enough to be on a two two and see play, right? Dude, I would this card would still be broken if it was a four mana one one. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, so like <laughs> so you can do the the, the the cheeky things where you're trying to put a seven drop into play. But you also just play, like, the deck that has, like, a, a lot of ways to make tokens and just, like, putting in more cards that make tokens or whatever, or, like, reasonable two and three drops, and you're still doing great. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with all of that. I will also add, too, that one of the reasons Winota hasn't been as completely dominant and standard as it was, uh, like, as it's looked in other formats, and it, it's been really dominant at points in standard, but it hasn't had consistent dominance in standard, is because it is actually kind of bad against the card Aethergust, specifically. And Aethergust is the most played card in standard at the moment. But Aethergust is gone. There's no, like, clear check to this card anymore. And a lot of the played removal doesn't necessarily remove it. So, all of that adds up to Winota coming down for a turn, you getting in a pretty insane attack in, and... People just don't recover from that first attack. You, If you don't have a sweeper immediately the next turn, you're going to lose. Like, on the spot, you're done. And even if you have the sweeper the next turn, the damage might have already been done. One window to hit can just... It just deals so much damage. It just, and it looks at so many cards, so it's like... We're even seeing it in 60-card decks. They're playing one real payoff, right? Like, one 7-drop human or 6-drop human, whatever it is. Like, they just have one, and that's enough. Because when you look at six cards and you trigger it two or three times, you're going to hit that one four of you have. And so your deck doesn't even have to be built in this way where it's really clunky. You can just play it like a value deck that has like one insane hit and be pretty likely to hit that one thing. Yeah, 100%. Everything you said is spot on. I mean, like, if you're playing a 60-card deck, by the time Winona comes down, you've seen, you know, 11, 12 of those cards. You know, 48 divided by 6 is, what, 8, right? So, like... Eight triggers to see your entire library, right? And I mean, like, if you're playing two or three copies of a card that you know win the game for you, you're very likely to find it. And that's just like if you're trying to play it that kind of way. If you yep. just want Edwin O to be like this card that just like nickel and dimes your opponent with like, like I said, like smaller creatures so that your deck isn't clunky. You know, it's not as explosive, but it's it's more consistent. That's the only way to do it. You don't have to be going over the top. You can just be having this format of four chord, literally draw cast and give haste to creatures in your deck. Yep, yeah. It, uh, uh, yeah. All, all it is to be said, this card, this card feels like it definitely fits into the 2020 what-the-heck-were-they-thinking role of cards we've been talking about. So, yeah. Okay. Number two, we have the adventure creatures themselves, and we... All right, admittedly, this is a little cheaty, it's hard to just say adventure creatures, um, but if we didn't do this, it would have been most of the list as adventure creatures because we actually think they're just that good. So we do have the entire package of adventure creatures here. We've got Bone Crusher Giant, we've got Murderous Rider, we've got Brazen Brower, and we're going to include all the rest of them too. You can have Fae of Wishes, you can have Lovestruck Beast, you can have Beanstalk Giant, Rimrock Knight you even mentioned. Every single one of these creatures has been awesome in standard they've all seen play and the mechanic might just be too good yeah i mean this card is like they kind of function like split cards but split cards make you choose one or the other whereas adventure mechanic lets you have your cake and eat it too yep um and they they did i i actually really want to commend 
was just for the cycle of adventure cards because I think they're all very good and playable, but they don't feel unenjoyable to play against. They don't generate bad experiences. You know, they're they're relatively reactive for the most part, maybe with the exception of Lost Truck Beast, like Bone Crusher, Brazen Bar, Murder Rider. They're all reactive, and we kind of came off of a, a, a time of magic where being reactive was really not the place you want to be. So, like, the fact that they pushed, you know, the power points towards reactive cards was nice. Uh, but they're also still uh, proactive in a way, too, because after they're done being reactive, they played the 2020, 2019 style of magic of being proactive, too. Um, and so, like, they're all powerful effects, you know, with good bodies. Uh, I mean, I don't really know what else to say about the cards. They're gonna, they're all monocolored, so you can slot them in a variety of decks. Um, if you want to be all in on the adventure mechanic, you can play them with uh, Edgewall Innkeeper, Lucky Clover. Uh, but if you just want to have a powerful, if you want to play Merce, or you want to play Hero's Downfall, but you have a 2 3 lifelink attached to it, that's just what these cards are. They're just so good. Yeah, I, I'm with you. I love, I love how the front half doesn't feel too good on any of them. It just feels fine, right? Like on all of them. It's like, you know, the Hero's Downfall that costs you two life. Good, but not game breaking it's fine right the bounce on brazen brower it's a card you'd want at times but not overpowered by any means just fine and two mana for a shock like you could get a better deal elsewhere but still when you want a shock it's good right and then the fact that they all just come with a body is just so good it, it just is so much like the package the whole is just so much better than the individual pieces and that's the coolest part about these cards is when you play against them, they feel good, they feel enjoyable to play with, but they don't feel like some of the other cards we've played against recently in Standard where it's like, that's the only thing that matters in the game, why is this card printed, it's dumb, it's way too powerful, there's no checks to it, it just feels it feels good and it feels like the type of magic people enjoy and it's awesome that they're as good as they are because they, they really are this good. I, I do expect them to kind of define the upcoming Standard because they're just they they just aren't that good they're so good yeah if, like i said it feels good to have it be in reactive cards like, yep it's just like we've seen so much of the, the snowball effects that these cards don't snowball they try to catch you up they try to make it so that it's not embarrassing to have you know murder strider in your deck it's like sometimes heroes not falls are very good because you're almost playing all one drops well then murder strider is a two a three man two three with lifelink sure sometimes uh, a shock doesn't do anything because you're both playing all these, you know, three dozen creatures or they're not playing creatures at all. Well, then you just play a three out of four three that punishes them for targeting the removal spell. Like this is just like a it's just perfectly designed uh, set of cards in my opinion. Yeah, I will say Wizards messed up a lot last year, but the adventure creatures were not one of them, and it's cool that they're going to be the building block of standard going forward. All right, at at number one, we have. Uh, Kind of a really big surprise for for the list. I don't think people saw it coming. Uh, we're putting Basic Mountain at number one as the yep. leftover. No, uh, all right, we're kidding. Everyone knows it's Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. There is no question about this. This is the best card in Standard at the moment. It will probably be the best card in Standard after rotation. I have a hard time imagining a scenario where it isn't. Uh, this is probably one of the best cards in Pioneer. It's one of the best cards in Modern. It's seeing play in Legacy. We're waiting until it breaks Vintage. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the only thing holding this card back from being the absolute best card in Legacy is the fact that Oko is still legal there, which is just ridiculous that they could both be in Standard at the moment. Uh, yeah. I mean, do you want to say anything about Uro? I mean... If you've been living under a rock, I guess maybe the card is a. Uh... <laughs> it asks so little. Like the the front half is just like explore that gains you life, um, and then it just turns it escapes for into like this card that just dominates the game that creates immediate value. Because you know the titans, the six drops, you know, they all create immediate value and then value every single turn afterwards. If they yeah, makes sense. Yep. And that's how titans work. Yeah. This card does the same thing, only. You get it for free out of your graveyard for four mana. Yeah. Um, which I don't really understand how that happened, but 2019 Magic, 2020 Magic. Well, it um, makes sense, right? Because it's not like the six drop ones were that good, right? I mean, yeah. No, they're, they're all unplayable. All, all well, yeah. Time. It's not like Primeval Titan's been one of the best creatures in Modern for the last 10 years. So we definitely need to reduce the cost on a card that was pretty similar to it, right? <laughs> yep, exactly. 
and make it a card that you can cast on turn three too. Because you know, six drops at least have the downfall of being in your hand till turn five or six. Yeah. Well, this card doesn't have that downfall. This card is still uh, cycles and uh, ramps you. Well, they also they also have the downfall of being pretty bad against counter spells. Let's be fair. Six mana creatures against counter spells have historically been pretty bad, and there was kind of a problem for them in their standard format, right? Was they got mana leaked, and that was pretty bad for them. Right. I mean, do you want to counter Uro? Like, <laughs> it just comes back. Yeah, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Any flashback card, at least when you try to counter it from the graveyard, it gets exiled, right? Yep. That's the end of it. Uro, not so much. No, Uro, they're just casting next turn because it's just so easy to put cards in your graveyard. It's ridiculous. Uh, Uro, Uro, Uro. Yep. Uh, I, I, I don't want to, you know... <laughs> ban talk. I'm trying, I'm trying to get, try and move past it. We've done a lot of banning this year. I'm hoping that it's going to be a lot less in the upcoming year. We're all excited for the new set. We're all excited for rotation. But if you told me right now, if you came back from the future and told me right now that Uro got banned in two, three months, I'd be like... And the sun came up today, you know, like, yeah. shocker. You know, so, I mean, there was uh, real argument to banning it during the last round of bannings when they hit Teferi. They didn't do that. They probably could have. Who knows? Um, I, I will say, though, that as good as Uro is, it is one, like, well-designed answer to it away from being just good and not broken, I guess, where... You see this in modern where Uro's definitely good, still good there, but it doesn't feel completely broken because it's a format where Path to Exile exists, it's a format where Relic of Progenitus exists. There are things you can do to beat it there, and it feels like if Standard had better tools for that, the card wouldn't be necessarily as broken. So maybe there's stuff coming in in Zendikar. We, we don't know, we haven't seen the set yet, but it, it does feel like it is a few tools away from it being reasonable, so hopefully they had foresight in not banning it and that they know something's coming. <laughs> I know you're trying to kind of play devil's advocate and give them a you know a, a window to maybe you know a, a ray of sunshine, a ray of light here. But what I'm trying to say is here, like my counter argument to your try to be positive is that like Path to Exile Relic are super efficient ways to answer the card, and it's still dominating modern, which is a, a format which has a huge card pool of degenerate things. And this is a standard that's about to lose a couple of sets. Um, and we, like, I don't know, I, I'm just not that hopeful that there can be an answer that, that really efficiently answers. Like, they printed Scavenging Goose in uh, the last core set, and it's Uro's still great. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's all fair. I don't know. I will say in modern, though, decks that have Relic generally are actually pretty good against the Uro decks. It's the other cards you lose, so it's not the Uro. And Relic is actually, like, a pretty good answer to Uro. So... Well, I mean, that's just how narrow cyber cards work, is that, like, if it's only attacking one aspect of the deck, then the rest of the deck just beats you. Well... So, like, in order to play Uro, you're not playing a graveyard deck. You're playing a good deck that just happens to have this card that works well off your, out of your graveyard, right? I mean, I, I agree with you, but I'm saying, like, Relic is perfect against those decks because it's not... A de it, like, it is a dedicated graveyard hate card, but it doesn't cost you a card, right? You just cycle, and by just continually attacking their graveyard resources with it, um, it makes it really hard for them to escape a row. So, like, it, that's what I mean by this. It's like, it's one of that type of effect, where it's like, Relic, if Relic was in standard, you could main deck that easily, because it just cycles, which, you know, very little downside. So, uh, you know, we'll see what actually ends up happening, but to your point of cards that could get banned, in my mind there's only two left, and it's exactly Winota and Uro. I don't think any adventure creature's gonna get banned, but those two certainly could. Um, I'm hoping they don't, but you never know. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, this year has been interesting, and I really hope that we get some more stability in the upcoming format. I'm really excited to see some Zendikar spoilers and start brewing. I'm sure we'll be creating content for you guys as soon as uh, those become available. But, yeah, until then, I think this, this is a good starting point for what the best cards are for the next format. And a uh, nice resource for, you know, when you're trying to build a deck know what's available what, and know what you have to be as well. Yeah, absolutely. And remember, guys, if you like this video, uh, subscribing to the channel, liking the video, all that helps. If you disagreed with any of our ordering or think one card is better than another, please leave a comment. We're actually pretty excited to argue this. This is something uh, Raj and I love to do is just discuss what the best cards are in a format at any given time. So feel free to hop in those comments and tell us, no, we got it wrong. Joel really should have been on here. Where was Extinction Event? I don't know. Maybe Raja convinced me to leave it off. I think it should have been on there. 
Got it. I really want the extinction event. In this just, time. just saying. If you, if you guys want to protest Raj's hating on extinction event, get in those comments. Protest it because it's kind of garbage. Not gonna lie. Um, okay. <laughs> so remember, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, also. Sharing sharing this video on social media, if anybody wants to do that, really helps us grow the channel. We would really appreciate it, so feel free to do that. Um, but with all of that said, we'll talk to you guys next time. See you guys.